If you are visiting with us today, we've got communion cups in the back, and if you need one, there's some folks standing in the back. You want to raise your hand, and we'll, we'll make a note. We'll get one to you. If you're visiting with us again, there are cards in the back of the pew. If you'll fill one of those out, pass it down. Hey, and more importantly, just stand up, stick around. We'd like to get to know you after service this morning. Chad Necessary is going to lead us in singing, and before we get started, let's stand, and we'll enter our worship together. together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come here and to worship you and for the freedom to do it. Uh, thanks to those overseas fighting, Lord. I ask that you be with us during this service. Help us to take what we've learned and to go outside and use it in our everyday lives, Lord. Help us to just be a shining light this week as we, as we go throughout our lives and, and go to work or school or whatever it may be. Lord, once again, thank you just so much that we get to come here and worship as a family and as one. In your son's name I pray, amen. So after the singing of these next two songs, we'll uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. When I survey the
concludes our Lord's Supper at this time the opportunity to give back as, as David and Prosper. We pray that you would bow with us now and just give thanks for all that the Lord has given us. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for the blessings that you have given us in this life. We are thankful to have been blessed to live in the greatest country in the world. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for the material things that you have bestowed upon us through the labor of our backs. We are thankful, Lord, for all these things. We pray, Lord, that as we contribute to the work here at Summers, that the monies will be used wisely to further your word, to further your teaching, to help those that are in need. We pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. If you would please stand for the singing of the next couple of songs.
Good morning. So if uh, you have been with us over the last few weeks, you know that we're in a series called Why Do We? And so we've been taking some of the basic characteristics uh, or traits of our life together as church, and we've kind of looked at uh, scriptural authority and guidance for why this congregation does things the way we do it. And so the church began on the day of Pentecost, some 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, the gospel of Jesus was preached, and some 3,000 people were then baptized into Christ and then added to the church by Jesus, their Lord. And the launch point of the church is recorded in Acts chapter 2, including how they conducted their life together as church uh, in these early days. And so Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 begins, So those who accepted his message, that's Peter's message, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone, and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. All who believed were together and held everything in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. And every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. And so when you read this section, uh, what has to stand out is this common shared life uh, that they speak of here. It's all bound up in this word in verse 42, this fellowship. But uh, even the breaking of bread around the Lord's table is an expression of fellowship. Uh, prayer is an expression of fellowship. And all through this section we see that they were together and they held all their possessions in a, a common trust... So if anyone had a need then, then they would gladly assist that person in meeting that need. And then they were daily continuing with one mind, it says, in the temple, the temple courts, breaking bread together, having meals then from house to house together with gladness and a sincere heart. So this is a community of people who, who are committed to one another. And so this is the first expression then of the life of the church. This first group who came together, they were a Jewish ethnic group, and within much of their heritage, there was this idea of communal support that was ingrained. And then as you move further away from that day in Jerusalem, you read how the Apostle Paul was instructing a predominantly non-Jewish congregation of Christians on, uh, on what was not an organic inclination. This wasn't natural for them in that sense. And so Paul presents this metaphoric image of this common life in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12, For just as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so too is Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. For in fact, the body is not a single member, but many. If the foot says, since I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it doesn't lose membership in the body because of that. And if the ear says, well, since I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it does not lose its membership in the body because of that. If the whole body were an eye, what part would do the hearing? If the whole were an ear, what part would exercise the sense of smell? But as a matter of fact, God has placed each of the members in the body just as he decided. If they were all the same member, where would the body be? So now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor in turn can the head say to the foot, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, those members that seem to be weaker are essential. And those members we consider less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and are un. Presentable members are clothed with dignity, but our presentable members do not need this. Instead, God has blended together the body, giving greater honor to the lesser member, so that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have mutual concern for one another. If one member suffers, everyone suffers with it. If a member is honored, all rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, and each of you is a member of it. 
And so in Christ, we're all sharing this one common life together under one common head, who is Jesus Christ. And then th this is a defining characteristic then of the church. We're marked by our unity, by our shared life, by our community. And so this is why we fellowship as we're looking at today. That's, that's the word. It sums it all up. And everything that we just read here from the apostle, that we, this is why we fellowship. Fellowship is critical to the life of the church, to the health of a church, because we're not called to a spectator event that happens on Sunday. We're called into a common, shared life with other believers. And so I may be answering a question today that no one's asking which wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> but understanding fellowship is to acknowledge the glue that holds everything that we do as church together. It's the common bond, the tie that, that binds. And so we are one flock. We have one shepherd, one kingdom, one king, one family, one father, one building, one foundation who is Christ the Lord. But uniquely introduced in the New Testament, the body of Christ is, is one body with one life source and one head. So we are a living organism dependent upon each other. And so I think about uh, growing up in the church as a kid, when I thought of fellowship, we talked about fellowships, I thought about a fellowship room, I thought about this space that we would go to right, when you ate ice cream or chili or deviled eggs and Never mix those together, by the way. People talk about fellowship, uh, kind of a very superficial. But the church's fellowship is much deeper than that. Our fellowship is spiritual. And so I, I've, I've grown then to understand how fellowship is essential. It's, it's profound. It's what Jesus prayed for in his high priestly prayer. John chapter 17, repeatedly, Christ prays. He willed that the people... Would, would, would come to him, the elect, the chosen, the saved, then they would be one. He said, let them be one as you and I, Father, as he prayed to his Father, as we are one. And so that prayer is answered then at baptism, when the believer then is added to the church, added to the body, added to the union, added to the fellowship by Christ. And so it works itself out then, it's made real, and how we treat and how we live with one another. And so we have this shared faith, a shared love, a shared purpose. And that's to glory, glorify God. We have a shared ministry, the, which is the proclamation of the gospel of Christ and, and God's kingdom invitation for all who will come. And then we have a shared truth of God's word, a shared power in God's Holy Spirit. We literally are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that is, that is fellowship. That's what defines the life of the church. So no sooner had the first disciples then come up from the baptism water than you see this common unity, this oneness, then begin to unfold, begin to live out in their lives. And so eight times in the New Testament, you have this uh, special word that the writer uses here. Kononeo means nothing to you other than it's, the definition, the, the, the usage of this word means to share. It means to participate. It means to partner with. It means to fellowship. They, he chose that word because of what it meant. And so the idea then becomes clear about the church. It's this uh, in common. And in Genesis chapter 1, from the beginning, we read how God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God is a relationship being. We have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he's created us then to be relational beings both with him and with one another. So when we see the church in the book of Acts, it's intensely relational. And you don't see people being baptized and then being left alone to themselves. Good luck. You know, believers are, are drawn to one another. They even seek out one another to, to share this new life in Christ. But I think looking around our society today, in a, in a, especially in a post-COVID world, I guess, the, the reality of the life of the church, I think, is lost in many 
instances. And so I'm speaking in a very general term, and I'm talking about religion then in the United States today appeals to people based on what they want. It's preference, preferential religion. So, so people start with, with seeing Christianity then as giving them something they want, meeting my needs. So I come to Christ, I come to a place with people to get my needs met. And so that certainly does not turn you loose to sacrifice your life for the, the needs of others then, if that's your launch point. So instead, too often, it, it can become a self-indulgence uh, that gets presented. A guy named Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. You may be familiar with it. In it, he speaks to the epic loss of serious thinking in Western civilization. Here's one section. He said, serious thinking is being replaced by entertainment. In specific, the mind-crippling power of television. But at least television is a group experience and screens are getting bigger so that more people can watch. Television, for all its dangers, is at least a group experience. I'm not so worried about huge television screens. Would you believe that was written in 1985? <laughs> That's when he wrote that. So Neil Postman could not have imagined the massive screen televisions that we have today. In fact, he probably could hardly see that at the same time screens are getting bigger, paradoxically, screens are getting smaller. And our society is producing the results of it. And so you have now seductive entertainment has gone from the big screen to the small screen. It used to be nobody wanted anybody to see them go into the theater, and now we can just sit over in a corner by ourselves with the same experience. And so look at how many theaters have closed just in the last few years, how things are changing. Entertainment has gone from being a group experience, it's gone from being a public experience to now being a very intimate, personal, private experience. A binge experience, if you will. And so uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, uh, Apple, uh, invented the iPhone, opened uh, Pandora's box to the world of personal digital devices. He once said of the iPhone, he said that when you, he said, when you look into the screen, do this right now. If you, have a, if, if you have a phone, a cell phone, take that phone out. Take that phone out. Let's take the phone out. He, and here's what Steve said. So I want you just to, just to look at your phone. If you've got a screensaver, black screen, make, put it on that. He said, when you look into the screen, you see yourself reflected back. Can you see? A, I can see myself right now in, my, in this screen. I can see myself. He said, when you look into your screen, you see yourself reflected back. And he went on to say, so in essence, you and the device are one. That was the goal. <laughs> that was the goal for the relationship between humans and devices to be one. And so now every person becomes a creator of their own private world, a world of preferences, a world of relationships, a world of temptations. A world that, that has a force, a world that has opportunity to be ubiquitous, omnipresent. How about that? A characteristic that we would attribute to God, omnipresent, ever-present, anywhere, anytime. Now we can be omnipresent, anywhere, anytime, through a device, virtual world. It's the opportunity to be completely self-sufficient and to do it in, in a virtual sense, of course. And that is completely opposed. It's completely opposed to fellowship of the body of Christ, the, the interdependence on one another, the shared life that Christ brings us into when we come through Him. And so for all the good, all the good, that technology can play in our lives. The false idea that we do not need other people is one of the greatest evils. Isolation, whether it's momentary or whether it's extended, that's where Satan thrives. He thrives in isolation. So this, this way of Jesus was brand new. Brand new in the first century. And those who were added to the church, they struggled. 
What do we do? <laughs> we know why we did this, but now what do we do with it, right? They, they struggled amidst persecution. Many hiding for their lives. They had outward threats. And then they had this, this radical blending of cultures then that was coming together for the first time and blending of ages for the first time and economics for the first time all coming together now within the church. And there were many who were just tapping out. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. They were leaving. They were leaving the groups. And, and some were even going back to their way of Judaism. Some of the Jews were like, hey, I, I can't deal with this, this nebulous thing of church. I'm going to go back where I'm structured. Here's, a, here's, my, here's my goat. You know, here's my lamb. Here's my grain. Here's my sacrifice. And so they were going back to that. And, so the, the, and some even back to pagan religions. And so the writer of Hebrews, he pleads with them. This entire letter, remain with Christ, remain with each other. Don't give up. And he tells them how to do that. Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 23, he says, Let us hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess, for the one who made the promise is trustworthy. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. The day is that eternal day, that final day. That's what our sight is on. And he said we should be encouraging and spurring one another along even more as we get closer to that great day when we're reunited with our Lord. And so the, the way of Christ is a crowded way. It's a crowded way in the sense that we don't travel that path of obedience alone. We travel with others, others who have committed their lives to Christ, and, and others who, like us, are living through the struggles and, and celebrating the triumphs of life. And so the encouragement, the, the push in the right direction, that can only come in community. It can only come together. That's God's design because that's the nature of God. That's His nature. That's who He is. And so real fellowship cannot exist in a world of self-created avatars. Christian fellowship requires real persons, real people. And so we're not made to live by ourselves in a world where we can live by ourselves with this massive form of temptation of which we are in complete control and nobody else knows about. That's not how we are made to live. We are made to live with accountability, with community. And so, you know, sometimes that, that, that complete control can, can be within a pixelated screen. And sometimes that complete control can be within the neurons of our own private mind. Either way, that is a spiritually dead end. So Paul wrote a letter called First, we know First Thessalonians, that's what we call it wrote to the church in Thessalonica. It's a letter of encouragement. It's a beautiful letter to new Christians who were struggling. Everything during the time of the New Testament writings is new, relatively speaking, right? But these, these were new Christians. And so they, they were doing fellowship well. They were doing some really good things, but he spurs them on. Keep on. Don't give up. He pushes them. Be more diligent. Stay together in your relationships with one another. And so listen to some of his closing remarks. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 14. He says, We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the undisciplined, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient toward all. See that no one pays back evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. So God never promises His children that, that He's going to spare us from pain and suffering in this world. Nowhere is that God is going to protect us, going to hold us uh, away from living in a, in a broken, spiritually hostile world. We will suffer broken hearts. We will suffer loss of loved ones. We will suffer economic distress. We will suffer poor health. We'll suffer agonizing family problems. We'll... We'll have ministry opposition. We may have ministry failure. We will experience this, especially when many of these pile up on you at once. Then hope can vanish in this cloud of, of pain and despair. And so what we need most during these times is the consolation of God. 
our loving Father. We need the touch of His empathy. We need the reminder of His promises that He will stand by us, that He, he has His hand in our lives, that He will work through this for good, and that He has this glorious future prepared for us. We need that. And so this comes from God through His Spirit of comfort. His Spirit of comfort that dwells with us and within us. It also comes from God through the Spirit of Christ among us in His church, the body of His Son. So we bring and we share this with one another. But we cannot do it in isolation. That's why fellowship is essential. And so across the religious landscape, you have churches who have been trying to give culture what it wants. Chasing culture. Give people what they want. Well, what do people want? What do most people want? Well, privacy. <laughs> you know, want convenience, uh, commitment anonymity, just go about my business, unaccountability, a lot of people want that. Mostly what people want is fulfillment and happiness. And so in a, in a world of personal playlists, a world of favorite channels, then we create our own personal playlist, our own personal religion. And we know what we want to hear. We know who we want to friend. And if we meet with, in fellowship with a group of people, chances are some of them are not going to like my playlist. <laughs> some of them are going to have a different opinion of stuff. Some of them are going to have different backgrounds. Some of them are going to have different ideas of what it means to be friend. And maybe their opinions aren't mine. So you, you, you might even have to listen to a preacher whose style is not yours. and You might have to sing a song and... 4-4 four, four time, led by a guy who gets a discount on his meals at eating out. And so I, wrote, I wrote that in. I did not know you were leading today, but I thought it was funny. <clears throat> One more year, buddy. I'm taking that discount. So a, a, large, a large part of our society feels entitled, though, to, to the world in the way they want it. They want it their way. It's like it's a Burger King world, right? Have it your way. And, and that's the world that they've created for themselves, and that's where they live. That's where these people live. So listen to what the Apostle John says, uh, writes about Christ. Those who come to know him as the apostles have come to know him. This is 1 John chapter 1. This is not the first John you come to. It's at the end of the New Testament. There's three books, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So this is 1 John chapter 1. In verse 3, what we have seen, he's talking from the perspective of the apostles, those who lived and walked with Jesus. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you too, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So the, the proclamation of the gospel is not to produce some individual isolated Christians. That's not the purpose. The proclamation of the gospel is not the end in itself. The preaching, the proclamation, the, the teaching is not the end. That's not the goal. We preach and we teach to produce a fellowship, a sharing, a common life, purpose, power, a, a ministry, testimony, all of this wrapped up together. The goal is not individual salvation from hell. And it's not just individual forgiveness. The goal is fellowship. The goal is to bring together. The goal is to unite with other believers. And that's all made possible through this fellowship with Christ who is in fellowship with the Father, in fellowship with the Spirit. And through Him, we are brought into fellowship with them. We're made one in Christ and with each other. And so everything about the church, everything about the church fights solitude. Everything about the church speaks against going it yourself. The consequence of sin is alienation. 
Sin alienates. It separates us. It isolates us from God. It's the blood of Christ, though, that makes possible the relationship, the restoration, the fellowship with God through Christ. Romans chapter 12, Paul writes in verse 4, For just as in one body we may have many members, and not all the members serve the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members who belong to one another. And so the gospel produces this fellowship that, that manifests, it makes Christ known in the world. That's who we are and what we do. His body was here. At one time it was here in a physical sense with a, His human incarnation. And so now His body is here. His body is here in a spiritual sense, incarnate in the fellowship of the church. We are evidence today of His body. We are Christ in the world. And so we have ice cream suppers. We have chili suppers. We have potluck lunches. We have game nights. We have work days. We have Bible classes. We gather together for worship. We do camping trips. We do mountain retreats. We have birthday parties, retirement parties, wedding showers. All of those are times of fellowship. Those are all great times. But I hope you have a deeper understanding of fellowship that's beyond just a day in just a time on a calendar. Fellowship is shared life. It's shared life, but it's not where we are selfish demanders. It's not where we're seeking our way in a group. We are thankful recipients. We are thankful recipients of, of the grace, the mercy, the salvation through Jesus Christ. And that's the basis for our fellowship. Aristides, during the second century, wrote about Christians. Uh, he was a pagan, but he observed the world around him, and he wrote this, speaking of Christians. He said, they, Christians, abstain from all impurity in the hope of the recompense that is to come in another world, when there is among them a man who is poor and needy, and if they have not an abundance of necessities, they fast for two or three days. They don't go out to eat. <laughs> they take what they would have spent in the drive through and they give it to someone in need. They supply the needy with the necessary food. Such is the law of the Christians and such their conduct. How about that? A pagan, a, a non-believer can be an observer. And look what he observed even so many years ago. The, the foundation of fellowship is salvation. The nature of fellowship is a shared life and love. And we have a symbol of fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we symbolize this morning is not the cup of blessing that we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ.